So uh, welcome everybody to week three. Today we're going to be going into a, um, yeah, there is a bad there. This is going to be um, an in-depth look into sonar, which is a specific um, navigation and detection system used. So, um, so let me go back real quick. We're gonna go over four questions, which is what is sonar? Why was sonar developed? How does it work? And what are its uses? So um, first of all, a brief overview. Uh, SONAR stands for Sound Navigation and Ranging. That's the acronym, um, which is why it's always in all caps. Um, SONAR is a method of navigation and detection that transmits and receives sound. It's a broad term because even though it's an acronym, which might suggest that it's like the name of one specific device, um, it actually refers to pretty much any device that transmits and receives sound for the purpose of navigation or detection. Um, a sonar device or a sonar equipment is uh, comprised of a transmitter and a receiver. And there are two predominant types, which are active and passive sonar. Today, we're going to be looking mostly into active sonar because passive sonar is uh, a very simple mechanism that we'll um, touch on briefly. Active sonar has a lot of nuances and it's probably the most versatile method of sonar available for like a wide range of applications. Um, it also has probably the most funding in the modern engineering context. Sonar transmits or emits sound with the use of a transducer, which is a device that converts energy from one form to another. Uh, the term transducer is also very broad. It might sound like sort of an intimidating term, but all a transducer is, is a device that can convert one form of energy to another form of energy. Like, does anybody know um, how, does everybody know how energy can take different forms? How about, um, name some different kinds of energy that you can think of. Electric? Yeah, electric and electricity is a good form of energy. Sound. Um, solar energy, yes. Sound is another type of energy. Thermal energy, heat is another type of energy. And solar is a type of light energy. Those are all good answers. Those are very useful um, sources of energy in our world, especially in technology. Um, you know, from solar panels to uh, speakers to heaters. All right, a transducer is any sort of device that can convert one form of electricity to another form of electricity. For example, if you like a heater, for example, converts electric energy from when it's being plugged into a wall outlet into heat energy. Um, a speaker, which plays music, will convert electric energy into sound energy, which is why electricity is so useful. We can create so many devices to convert energy from different forms. Um, in sonar, we'll, we're gonna be dealing with transducers that convert electric energy to sound energy, like speakers. Um, sonar transmits sounds as pings or bursts. If you've ever heard of sonar or like ever pictured a submarine in your head, you'll probably like think of that characteristic like ding sound that comes out periodically from the submarine as like it's trying to navigate its way. And those are like actually just little bursts of sounds. Um, the actual ping is just an indicator to a crew that the sound is being sent out because um, sonar sound waves are usually too low frequency or too high frequency for humans to really hear. Um, a sonar receiver receives sound with a hydrophone, which is another term that just means uh, a microphone that's waterproof, a microphone that's designed to be used underwater. And sonar is used mainly for submarine or underwater navigation. Sonar can also be used to navigate vessels like submarines and ships and explore the oceans as well as to detect obstacles, dangers, and threats. Um, for example, at war, uh, if you're in a submarine, you're gonna wanna know if there's other submarines out there that might be trying to attack you. Um, if you're in a ship, you might be trying to figure out if there's anything below the water that could also be trying to attack you. So sonar can be really useful since we can't really as humans see very well underwater. It's very, actually very dark under the surface. Um, we'll be getting into the origins and history of sonar now. So as we learned last week, some animals um, through evolutionary processes have adapted to use echolocation as a biological form of sonar. They can emit sounds from their throats and mouths and 
pick up on those sounds with their ears, which is actually a form of active sonar that lets them navigate their way. Um, so the oldest example of sonar ever would have to be bats because they evolved to, for example, bats, I mean, because they evolved to use sonar naturally. Um, in 1490, however, the famous inventor, uh, painter, and Renaissance man, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, you guys have probably all heard of him, I don't know who hasn't, um, used a tube in the water to detect ships that were out of viewing range. So he basically stuck a tube um, under the surface of the ocean and put his ear up to it, and he could hear the vibrations and sounds of um, ships that were moving th through the water. Um, Sonar went largely undeveloped, undescribed um, until the 19th century, which is the 1800s, when underwater bells started to be employed by lighthouses and ships to communicate to each other with underwater sound. Um, this is also when the first hydrophones were developed because um, sound, which wouldn't be able to be loud enough to travel in through air, was instead able to be transmitted through the water. And because it moved so fast, the ships could communicate with each other that way. Um, then uh, in the next century, in the, 19, in the year 1912, echolocation was first described for the purposes of um, developing a kind of technology that could help avoid disasters like the Titanic disaster. Does everybody here know what happened to the Titanic? Um, it hit an iceberg and then, um, fell. I mean, sunk. That's right. Uh, the Titanic was this gigantic ship that was host to thousands of passengers. Uh, and a lot of those actually tragically passed away. They died because the Titanic hit an iceberg under the surface of the water that it couldn't see. And because the hull of a ship, um, is under the water, um, the iceberg that penetrated the hull caused water to start flowing into the ship itself. Um, so because of the Titanic disaster, it could survive. It was believed to be a brick. Yes, they called it the unsinkable ship. And ironically, it sunk. It could have survived if they had avoided the iceberg. <laughs> um, they tried to shut out the water, but the influx of water was too fast, I believe. Um, and actually the gash that the iceberg caused was only six inches wide, I believe. It was pretty small. People just didn't take it seriously enough. If the boat didn't turn, you're right. Um, yeah, but the Titanic was a tragedy and to avoid that sort of accident, people started trying to look for ways that we could see those kinds of things underwater. Um, this led to echolocation being looked to, like as a method of how could we see without our eyes, but also had a fire on it. Um, if anything, that fire was probably caused by some complications from the influx of water. But anyways, echolocation was described in 1912 following the Titanic disaster as researchers started looking to um, ways we could possibly see under the surface of the water, especially at night. And subsequently, a year later, the first patented sound ranging system was designed to detect icebergs. So the first tangible design that was designed and proven to work was made in 1913. And this thing could, um, in a relative to today's technology, it could in a crude way detect how far away icebergs were under the surface from the hull of a ship. The iceberg on the side, if the boat was survived, I think it hit at the front. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. It would have definitely made an impact on which rooms could have been shut or which rooms would have been flooded. But, um, I mean, there's no real way to know. I'm not that knowledgeable on the subject of the sinking of the Titanic other than that it was caused by an iceberg that was invisible to the crew itself. Um, in 1918, with the onset of the First World War, um, which lasted from 1914 to 1918. So this was at like the end of the war. The first dedicated sonar prototypes were developed by France for anti-submarine warfare. Could people not float? I mean, they grabbed onto things that could float. Also human bodies naturally float. Um, your organs make you buoyant. 
that means they all hate him. Anyways, I was responding to L. All right, continuing on at the tail end of the First World War, the first zone of prototypes were developed by France to combat the threat of submarines. So I'm sure everybody knows what a submarine is, but they were designed during World War I by the Germans to attack ships without the ships being able to fight back. And because that was just like such a huge problem for the allied nations, which compri were comprised of like France, uh, Great Britain, Russia at one point, and the United States, that was such a big issue for them that they decided to start put investing more research into sonar in order to detect these submarines and avoid them. Um, sonar development went largely stagnant, which means unprogressive, until World War II, which is when sonar, the acronym for sonar, was named and developed into systems that were portable on naval ships to defend against now efficient and deadly weaponized submarines. So as sonar progressed, so did submarines. By World War II, every single nation had developed a submarine that could submerge at least 100 meters underwater, which is far below what a human can see, and could fire accurate torpedoes that could sink. Well, because they didn't think it would ever sink. Some grabbed onto falling things. From the boat. Yeah, they actually didn't bring enough lifeboats. That I know. They were also hesitant to release the lifeboats in the first place. So submarines became super deadly around World War II. They became this um, force to be reckoned with that could cause serious damage to a lot of ships. And because of that, sonar had to be developed. Um, and it progressed so rapidly that it could be portable on almost any naval ship. So almost every single naval ship could detect submarines uh, under the surface of the water without being able to see them. Um, then in the 1960s, we have Project Artemis, which um, sounds really cool, but in reality, it just was a research project that created the foundation for a lot of the sonar techniques that we use today during the Cold War. Um, honorable mention, submarines became a huge threat in the Cold War because submarines can actually carry nuclear missiles. And because submarines can't be seen under the surface of the water, that's obviously a huge problem because, it, it, um, as you know, 70% of Earth's surface is covered by uh, water. And that enables a nation to like launch nuclear missiles from 70% of the Earth's surface, anywhere on that in the ocean. Whoops. And we're going to look at why sonar needed to be developed, what necessitated it. Uh, as I just mentioned, over 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water. Um, much of this water was, following the Industrial Revolution and rise of international trade and accessibility, traversable by man-made vessels. Um, following the Industrial Revolution, which was this technological boom in human history, um, international contact and trade like rose to a level that we know today. So for the first time in history, trade was like genuinely widespread. Like traders from Europe could sail to Asia uh, and vice versa. Um, and suddenly waterways around the world were invaluable. They were just as important as roads. Uh, oceans were just as important as highways. Um, essentially, because of this widespread use of, of ocean water that couldn't be um, visually navigated very well. Uh, sonar needed to be developed. Um, also in order to protect shipping from sub, uh, submarine threats. Um, ships needed a method of navigation to understand what dangerous obstacles would collide beneath the sea. The, one of the best examples of this is the Titanic again. Um, it's just exemplary of the types of threats that ships needed to combat when they sailed in the ocean. They needed to know what was like beneath the water. Um, the first practical sonar use, as I mentioned before, was to detect icebergs underwater, which could prove very dangerous to ships. Um, the submarine threat in warfare during World War I necessitated the need for a counter strategy. So because submarines got so deadly um, over World War I and World War II, um, sonar needed to be developed so that these submarines could be seen and countered. And the rise of the submarine as a prolific tool for a variety of tasks again necessitated a boom in the efficacy of sonar for more accurate and reliable navigation. So nowadays, the submarine isn't just used to wage war. It's not just used to shoot torpedoes at ships and sink them. The submarines um, 
from man to unmanned, meaning like from submarines that are piloted to submarines that don't even require pilot and are just piloted by computers. Um, submarines are used for a wide, a wide array of tasks. Oceanographers and marine biologists need to see very deep beyond the water, like beyond what scuba gear can get you. And for these um, submarines to effectively navigate their surroundings, they need to be equipped with sonar. Um, and sonar relies on sound, which probably gets well through water almost five times as fast as through air, around 1500 meters a second, as opposed to 343 meters a second speed of sound through air. And um, this sort of necessitated sonar as the de facto method of submarine navigation because sound traveled very well where light could not. So again, we're going to be going over active sonar. This is contrasted with passive sonar, which shares the name of sonar, but only receives sound. Passive sonar is a less widely effective and less useful tool. So passive sonar, um, basically just involves just a hydrophone, just a microphone that can detect sound coming in um, and is like a very rough approximate tool that can help you know what's coming. Um, active sonar is a navigation, is an advanced navigation detection system that involves sending out sound of your own and listening to the reflections. Um, and these returning reflections can judge the distance of surroundings, the movement and the track targets. And active sonar is really useful underwater for submarines and underwater navigation, um, precisely because it can allow them to track targets beyond what you would even be able to see on the land. Um, active sonar can help build pictures on the ocean floor from multiple angles. So these pings can be sent out from multiple angles and the returning reflections and echoes of sound can allow a submarine to understand what the ocean floor looks like. Here are some key terms we're going to be using sort of extensively in the operation of active sonar in these coming slides. There is uh, the term pulse, which is a spike of sound waves sent out instantaneously. I believe I um, did replicate that before. It's the ding noise that happens when sound is sent out from a sonar system. Hydrophones are underwater microphones that receive sound. Bearing is relative horizontal orientation, which is just the angle at which something is to you. Uh, if you've ever heard the term, get your bearings straight, like I need times to get my bearings, um, that is, that gets its um, name from this term, bearing. Uh, compass, for example, is the best example of uh, a device that can gauge bearing. Uh, it essentially just gauges the, the, the angle that something is relative to you. In the case of a compass, the it's pulled. A multi-beam is an array of beams used by a sonar emitter in a cone. So when a sonar emitter sends out pulses in multiple different directions, that's a multi-beam. Um, reflections and echoes are the, essentially synonymous. They are the bouncing and return of sound waves off of an object. The emitter is the producer of sound waves. We talked about transducers. The transducers would be emitters because they are the ones that produce and propagate sound waves. Um, receiver is the recipient of sound reflection. Uh, hydrophones act as receivers. Radial speed is a little bit of a more difficult concept, but radial speed is a speed of an object relative to a sphere. Um, the sphere here is different from like what a ball is, but it is still the same in concept. So when using sonar, sound will obviously, like in an ideal environment, it will travel in uh, an equal amount of distance in all directions. And that forms a sphere. Um, through which sound propagates. And the radial speed of an object is going to be the speed of an object relative to um, the speed at which the sphere is moving. So let's say that you have an, uh, a sonar system moving on a submarine. The radial speed of an object further away from that submarine um, would be the speed at which, at which it's moving, let's say, to the right. Or the Transmission loss um, this is a wordy explanation, but it's actually was quite simple. Transmission loss just refers to any kind of interference that a sound wave can face while it's traveling through the water. So um, this can involve, I wrote here, spreading, absorbing, and scattering by ocean inhomogeneities, which are bubbles, different substances, absorptive blockages. Um, that's a verbose way of saying that any like 
um, non-uniformity or any like disturbance in the water, like a different substance or like um, a cloud of bubbles um, can disrupt the transmission of a wave. It won't travel as well through that as it would just through normal water. And so that is transmission loss. And transmission loss is the biggest obstacle faced by sonar systems because it can really mess with the quality and concentration of a sound wave coming back to you in the season. Here we're going to learn about another nuance of modern sonar systems is a Doppler effect. Has anybody ever heard of the Doppler effects? Just say yes if you have or if you've experienced with it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we'll go be going over this. The Doppler effect is a really useful um concept in sonar. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the term Doppler. It was first described in 1842. The Doppler effect is the um, way in which um, sound can change depending on the distance and speed that something is from an object. That sounds weird, but with this example, I think it will be cleared up. Sound will actually seem higher pitched to you if an ambulance with a siren on is, say, is moving towards you instead of away from you. Okay, so let's say an ambulance is heading towards you. The siren is going to be at a higher pitch than it, it's going to sound like it's at a higher pitch or it's going to sound like the pitch is increasing um, as opposed to if it was moving away from you. If it was moving away from you, then the pitch would sound like it was decreasing. The reason for this is that sound travels in waves. Sound is, I'm sure you know, a vibration through molecules. And, um, these waves that are being emitted from the source of a sound um, are sent out at a constant frequency or like rate. Um, if, you're, if you are moving away from an object that is producing a sound um, and you are moving away from it at a constant speed, the time that it takes for those sound waves to reach you is going to continue to increase. What that means is that the frequency of that sound will continue to decrease as you move away from it, which will affect the way that the noise sounds to you. It's a little bit of a weird concept to grasp. But essentially, because you don't really think about it happening, but it's really quite simple when you understand that sound is essentially being transmitted away from an object in waves and those waves take time to travel to um, two different recipients. And if one recipient is moving closer, the other is moving away, then those waves are going to continuously reach one faster and the other slower. Um, so the Doppler effect is the effect responsible for the change in the pitch of sound when an object is moving away relative to the source. That pretty much sums up what I just said. Sound waves take longer or shorter to travel to an object as the object draws closer or farther out of it. So everybody knows that sound has a speed. And the farther you are away from something, the longer it's going to take for uh, that sound to reach you. But if you're moving away from it at a constant speed, then the co if you continuously hear that noise, it's going to seem like it's the pitch is decreasing. That's essentially what the Doppler effect is. Continuing, um, and its application in sonar is that it can be used to detect the bearing and movement of an object with sonar. Um, this is actually sort of brilliant because in active sonar, if you recall, a ping is sent out from a transmitter and then reflected off of an object and then picked up by a receiver. What this means is that the frequency and pitch of that received echo can be measured. Now, if you recall what I just mentioned about the Doppler effect, if the pitch of a reflection off of an object that you're tracking is decreasing, then that means that it is getting further away at a constant rate. And if you guys follow, um, what do you guys think that means if the pitch coming from an object is increasing? That means they're getting closer? Yeah, exactly right. Because the Doppler effect, the Doppler effect means that um, the higher frequency uh, you receive at um, climbing at a higher rate means that 
an object is coming close to. Yeah. So Doppler effects can be used to effectively gauge motion and not just how far away something is and uh, where it is. Uh, in this way, submarines can track threats like torpedoes coming towards them or another submarine or another ship or even a large fish. Um, Oceanographers or marine biologists can use the Doppler effect with sonar systems to track things like even like sharks. Um, the difference in frequency or wavelength of a sound is measured and then the computer inside of a sonar system can convert it into a velocity with mathematical algorithms. Um, Doppler shifts, which are instances of the Doppler effect. A Doppler shift would be, for example, if, um, if something sounds lower pitched as it's going away from you, that's a Doppler shift because the pitch is shifting. Um, Doppler shifts require that the receiver's motion must also be taken into account. Um, essentially, that means that in these computerized algorithms, the speed and direction at which the sonar system on a submarine, for example, is moving has to be factored in. Um, because if the object is, seems to be moving away according to like the Doppler effect algorithm at the same speed that the submarine is moving, then that means it's not moving at all. Um, not only the static landscape, but moving objects can be also accurately tracked and potentially pursued or avoided with modern sonar systems. Um, so sonar uh, can not only just build a graph of the ocean floor, but it can also track these moving objects. Um, because the properties of sound change as a recipient of sound waves move from the source, the reflection of these sound waves replicate the effect indicating to the receiver the motion and directional movement of the tracked object. Uh, that just describes the whole process by which um, sonar is used to detect moving objects. And to a, another nuance of sonar, we have different uh, radiological arrangements. These are going to be important because these same principles are used by radar, which we're covering in next lesson. These three arrangements we're going to be going over are monostatic operation which is in a nutshell where the transmitter and receiver are in the same place by static operation, the root by meaning two and the root mono meaning one, by static operation, which is where the transmitter and receiver are separate, or in other words, in two different positions, and multi-static operation, multi being, meaning many, where there are multiple transmitters and receivers in different spots. Um, we're going to be going to mon monostatic operation first. Each one has its own applications and own uses. Monostatic operation in a detection navigation system that uses waves like sonar is where the transmitter and receiver are co-located or located together operating from the same system. For example, bats in echolocation would be monostatic operation because the sounds that they are emitting and the ears which they're using to receive the sound are in the same, located in the same place. Um, Monostatic operation, like I just said, is where the transmitter and receiver are co-located or located together operating from the same system. Sound waves are sent through the same path forward and back. This concept is something that can be used as both a pro and a con because sound waves travel from a transmitter to a target encountering obstacles like transmission loss. Remember transmission loss from the vocabulary? Um, as the sound wave travels from the emitter to the target, it's going to, it might encounter things like bubbles or disturbances. Um, which could disrupt the way that it comes back to the receiver. Because the sound waves travel back to the same path as they're reflected from the target, they can be further degraded and along the same path. Let's say here's your sonar system, here's your target. Um, the emitter is going to send a sound to the target and is going to travel back along the same path to come back to the receiver. If there's an obstacle in the way, then that obstacle's effect, negative effect on the sound wave is going to be multiplied. Um, which is a weakness of monostatic operation. The farther that sound travels, the greater the loss. That goes without saying. So this would multiply the, the this would again just multiply the difficulties of that wave um, by two. Two-way loss is the concept that sound waves lose integrity from receiver to target than target to receiver. And the ping cannot be detected as the ping is being sent out. This is another weakness. Because while the ping is happening, that's going to be all that the receiver is detecting. So the receiver can't really detect any re reflections while a ping is being sent out, making the mapping of any sort of environment to be intermittent. If you all follow that, that just means that 
you have a real-time navigation. You have a real-time chart of your surroundings for the purpose of navigation in pings, in the cycle of the pings. And monostatic operation is most effective for vessel navigation because the entire system is located on just one ship. Bistatic operation. This is, like I, uh, like I mentioned before with the read by, a system in which um, the emitter and receiver are located in two different spots. This is also a technique that's emulated in radio. Transmitter and receiver are separated by a distance roughly equivalent to the distance of the tracking target, which forms sort of an equilateral triangle. And it can help mitigate the risks of corrupted waves in monostatic operation because the sound is traveling through two different paths to reach the receiver instead of just one. This can sort of create a balancing act, which can help the consistency of the wave and the integrity of the wave. And there is only one way loss against two different paths. So you're essentially trying your luck to say, okay, maybe that path isn't so good. So we're not going to send it back along the same path. We're going to send it along a different path. And biostatic operation is in which sound travels from the transmitter to a target. And then the target reflects that sound to a receiver in a different location. Sound waves uh, can avoid in this way encountering the same obstacle twice, like bubbles or uh, oil in the water. And ping can be detected at any time by the receiver because the receiver is, will be mapping the location of the um, emitter, but that will not interfere too badly with its reception from the targets. Lastly, we have multi-static operation. This is an enhanced version of bi-static operation. I say that because it builds on the advantages of bi-static operation. It involves a vast web of multiple components, which are multiple transmitters and receivers, and the diversity of receiver locations can help detect the properties of a track target from all angles and more accurately. Um, in other words, because there are multiple receivers, they can get um, reflections from an object from different perspectives of it. So if you go back to this picture I had here, these three different receivers or transmitters can all receive different perspectives of the plane. This way they can sort of triangulate the motion of the uh, plane or really just create a more consistent image because they can relay the information that they get about the plane with each other to build a complete picture. With a system like monostatic operation or bistatic operation, you just have the one transmitter and the one receiver. No matter what you do, bistatic operation is only a method of circumnavigating the um, difficulty of two-way interference. Um, Multi-static operation involves just getting a very reliable and consistent picture of a moving object. So the target can be tracked reliably this way, but it's not very useful for navigation as a navigated vessel must have a sonar system on board. This is much, much, much more useful for detection. This is how ballistic missiles are um, tracked as they enter the atmosphere. This is also how meteorological phenomena like anything from asteroids to clouds can also be um, uh, tracked. Sonar is a method of sonar which pro projects sound through air instead of water. And if you recall, this isn't as efficient, but this can help again with multi-static operation to triangulate the position of planes and meteorological phenomena. And again, just like in bi-static operation, the sounds traveling through multiple paths create uh, a number of pathways so significant that it can never be completely obscured by one blockage. Here are some applications of sonar to wrap up the lesson. Um, broadly speaking, military applications. The military is very concerned with precision of what is where at what time. Sonar is extremely helpful as a tool for especially the Navy to know exactly where a potential enemy's ships are located and where their submarines can be lurking. Anti-submarine warfare is the largest and broadest of these military applications, and it can involve anything from tracking the position of a submarine to knowing where the torpedo that it fired is to launching weapons at the submarine. Uh, submarine navigation is another application of sonar. Um, because obviously the crew can't really look outside the submarine and like see where it's going that deep underwater. Um, sonar is gonna help the submarine navigate. Uh, torpedo guidance is another thing. We will go into this more as an application of radar because radar is more of a guidance system sort of thing than sonar is. Um, but in a nutshell, 
Sonar can be used to guide torpedoes by sending out pings, locating a target, and then using a computer to turn the torpedo towards that target that it's trying. Mine detection is another big thing. Um, mines can be laid in the sea for ships to hit or get attracted to, which could destroy them, and sonar will help ships detect them. Mine the guidance for guided mines that will guide themselves to ships will also be using forms of sonar to um, use this ability. Fishing is another um, big application of sonar because fishers can help locate their nets and big catches with the help of sonar uh, detection. Echo sounding is a technique used by um, oceanographers to use uh, the sounds of echoes to map out the um, different features in the landscape of the ocean floor, uh, which ties into ocean mapping. Wave measurement is also a scientific application of sonar. A way, uh, sonar can easily be used to judge the properties of waves based on like how it comes back, how fast it comes back. And seabed substance detection is another big thing. Um, if there's an oil leak from an oil rig, then sonar can help detect that oil through that interference. And that about wraps it up for today. That was a large overview of what sonar is, what it can help accomplish, and how it works. Uh, thank you all for coming.